Hello Internet and welcome to another tutorial video for Cataclysm Dark Days Ahead. In this episode, we will be talking about the character creation process. Now this isn't overly complicated, but there is quite a lot of variety and there are some important things for you to know. So settle in, this will probably be like a 30-ish minute video. Again, this should be timestamped as well, so you can check the description down below to jump to a specific section or hover over the video timeline to see labels for each portion of the video. Now in order to create a character, you will first need to create a world. We did cover that in a previous episode, so I'm hoping you already know how to do that. There are a few ways to play the game, but the main three are custom character, preset character, and random character. Now you'll see these options when you select new game from the main menu, and we will talk about custom characters in a lot of detail here in a moment, but let's talk about the other options first. Selecting random character will give you random everything. It will randomize your starting location, your profession, your stats, your skills, all that stuff. Now it doesn't force you into the game immediately, so you can go back and edit that character that was randomly generated. And this is a fine option if you're just looking for something to play and and because it doesn't force you into that specific character and you do get a chance to edit them that means that even as a new player you can go back and remove some of the more difficult things that it might give you now, i don't really recommend this in general unless you're in the mood for it many starting scenarios can be pretty difficult especially for a new player and some just plain are not fun in my opinion so i'd recommend not doing this until you have a pretty decent handle on the game Next up, we have preset character. Now, basically, when you create a custom character, you can save that template for future use. Those will be listed here when you select preset character. Cataclysm also has the kindness to save your most recently rolled character so that you can quickly re-roll that same exact layout if you get killed shortly after you start the game. I don't use templates very often, but it is a nice feature to have, especially that last character option. And then finally, custom character will allow you to build your character from the ground up, so let's uh, select that and dive into the process. Now this first screen that you will see is the points tab. This consists of multiple pools, which is the default as of the time of this recording, single pool and free form. Character creation uses a point based system for building your character and this option determines how those points are going to be distributed. If you select multiple pools, for instance, there are multiple separate pools of points. For example, if I gain points by taking negative traits, I cannot use those points to buy myself new stats. Those are two separate pools of points and blah 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 etc. If you use single pool, you can gain points by taking negative traits and then spend those same points on any aspect of character creation. It is a single pool of points that can be applied to anything. And then freeform gives you infinite points so you can build your character however you want without any constraints. There is also an option in your settings menu so that you can have more starting points to spend if that's something that interests you. You can do that if you find yourself struggling, but I typically recommend to people that they start with single pool and default values. I myself only use single pool for character creation I like the versatility of that and I think that's the easiest thing for a new player to grasp. At the end of the day though, you can choose whichever option you want, no one is going to judge you, do whatever is most fun for you. You can move up and down in these various menus using the arrow keys or 2 and 8 to move up and down. When you move your cursor over a pull type, you can press enter to select it and you can press tab to move over to the next tab of character creation. Once again, tabs in this game are generally navigated by using the tab key to move right and then shift tab to move left. Anyway, this is the Scenario tab. In Cataclysm, your scenario determines where you will start the game. It will also determine which professions are available to you, and, and of course we'll talk about professions in the next tab. So a scenario basically sets the stage for how you're going to start the game. This is where a lot of the replayability of this game comes in. Starting in a mall overrun by the undead plays very differently from a character that starts in a cabin in the woods. Some of these scenarios contain multiple possible starting locations, whereas others actually lock you into a single building. Building. Now you can do this by changing your starting location on the final screen of character creation. Just remember that this is available to you, we'll talk about that at the end, and it will be based on which scenario you choose. Now I really cannot stress this enough, I highly, highly, highly recommend that for your first game, I mean honestly for like your first 10 games or so, you should be using the evacuee scenario. This is the most vanilla start in the game, it guarantees temporary safety, and you can choose basically any profession in the game. Please start here. It is in your best interest, I promise. Please don't be one of the people who comes in complaining about how difficult the game is and then revealing that you jumped right into the very difficult scenarios. You need to start with the evacuee scenario. 
Now, if you're a returning player, you might notice that these scenarios look a bit different than they used to. They shook things up maybe like a year and a half ago. Many of the old scenarios were merged into categories and then you will use the final screen of character creation to set your starting location. And of course, again, we will talk about that when we get there. Now you can sort this menu either by name or by points and you can toggle that by pressing the lowercase s key. You can also select a random scenario by pressing asterisk, which on the standard US keyboard is shift eight. You will also notice that many of these scenarios are labeled with the word challenge. Now these vary in difficulty, but in general should be avoided by new players. Some of them can become very easy when you know what you're doing, but others are virtually impossible unless you follow a very narrow and specific path. The Migo Camp, for instance, assuming you actually try to play it out instead of just running away, is in my opinion the toughest scenario in the game at the moment, and for most players it will be frustrating and really unpleasant. One more thing to notice is the point list at the top of this screen. More challenging scenarios Scenarios like those will give you more points to use for character creation. Evacuee is baseline though and it gives you zero points. Please start with the evacuee scenario. We get so many people who struggle to learn the game and then they complain about the difficulty. Evacuee is the starting point. Learn the game from there, then expand to other scenarios as you get experience. Other scenarios in this list are more interesting for sure and more fun than the basic evacuee scenario, but jumping into them too early will inevitably lead to you being frustrated and I don't want you to abandon the game due to that frustration. But anyway, that's enough. That's enough begging. Let's move on to professions. Professions are sort of like your character's class. They determine what skills and equipment your character will start the game with. We've had a few additions to professions over the years, so some of them now start with in-game things like pets and proficiencies. Now, pets are pretty self-explanatory, but proficiencies are basically things that make crafting faster and easier. In other words, if you start the game with a sewing proficiency, your character would be better at making clothing than someone without it. Now, the profession list is quite long and can be very annoying to flip through. If you want to search through this list, you can use the forward slash key, that is the one that shares the same key as a question mark on US keyboard, and this key can be used to search through many menus in the game, so try to remember that one. This only allows you to search by name, I believe, which uh, does limit its use, but it's at least something. You can also press the lowercase s key to change how the list is sorted, either by name or by the amount of points that it costs, and you can press asterisk here to select a random profession. On the left side here, you can see a list of what professions you can currently select. Again, this is based on which scenario you chose. On the right side, there will be a list of important information. There are many things that a profession can give you and not all of these categories will apply to every profession. In general though, you will almost always start with some clothing and basic equipment. Some professions are better equipped than others and this is why they cost you varying amounts of points to select. Now the standard character for the evacuee scenario is Survivor. This is a bland vanilla class and is a pretty good place to start as a new player. It comes with matches, water, and a pocket knife which you will find pretty handy when you're first starting out. The other benefit here is that it costs zero points. If you look at the top of the screen, you'll see that we have eight points left. Now many professions will actually cost you points to select. Some professions are worth the points that they require because they give you things that will cost more if you had selected them manually. Sometimes what you select will give you a valuable item or bionics that you would otherwise not be able to add manually in other areas of character creation. And then there are some professions that are a complete waste of points because you can build a more optimal character yourself for fewer points. Some things though, as I said, can't be selected manually. You cannot manually select your own pets and bionics. You have to have a profession that starts with them. Now in the future, some of these things may be obtainable using hobbies, which is a tab we'll talk about here in a bit. But anyway, professions are where I would suggest you experiment. Try a game with the survivor profession and then try some of the others. Now I told you to stick to one specific scenario, but professions are much less likely to, I don't know, completely ruin your character. So feel free to try some of these out. Now I personally almost most always select the backpacker class. It's a very vanilla start that has no real major benefits other than starting with a backpack. The other that I would recommend for you is called Bionic Prepper. This is a very powerful profession that gives you all the tools you will need to survive in the early game, mostly the valuable bionics. You literally start the game with a bionic that sucks water out of thin air for you to drink, a fire starting tool, a variety of other valuable bionics, several proficiency skills, and a slew of decent clothing and weapons. 
but I guess we should probably take a moment and talk about Bionics. So currently these Bionic Professions are only available if you use the Bionic Professions mod, which is included with the game and is enabled by default, which we saw in our world creation video. Now in the future, probably in the very near future, Bionics are being changed in Cataclysm. This means that if you're watching this eight months or a year from now, these professions might not exist at all and you would have to find an outside mod to enable them. There will still be cybernetics in the game, but they're going to come from a different place and they will probably not exist in character generation except for in certain mods. Now we'll talk more about that when we get to our Bionics tutorials, but for now, don't fret over it too much and I would encourage you to try out some of these different professions. Our next tab is actually a very recent addition to the game. This is the Hobbies tab. Now Hobbies can do a few things. They can give your character addictions, skills, traits, or proficiencies, and it's possible that in the future this will be expanded to allow for adding more stuff. These hobbies allow you to have more control over your character. For example, previously if you wanted to start the game with a drug addiction, you had to select a specific profession that started with an addiction. Now instead, you can have a lot more freedom selecting any profession and then selecting a hobby that grants an addiction. Since hobbies are so new and so different, I don't really have any suggestions on which are the best. But like previous screens, you can see the list of hobbies on the left and what they do on the right side, and there will be a description at the bottom as well as a point cost or point gain at the top of the screen. Now the only thing here that really needs explained is for skills. Hobbies that grant skills will list them in categories and the order is beginner, intermediate, competent, and then advanced. Now these categories are abstract for a reason, they don't actually give you flat skill levels. Now these hobbies actually directly use experience, so the number of levels you gain will actually be variable. And this variable number of levels will depend on how many other skills you get from other aspects of character creation. This is a bit difficult to explain, but for example, if I take the gearhead hobby and I take no other skill levels in mechanics, either from professions or from my skills tab, I can see that I only will gain one level in mechanics. Now you can check your total skill level in the final screen of character creation. But if I take that same hobby and I add one level of mechanics in the skills tab, you'll see that my total skill level becomes two with a 11% progress towards level three. So it did not give me one flat level from taking the gearhead hobby, it actually gave me a set amount of experience that is then tacked on top of all the other aspects of character creation. Man, I hope that makes sense. That sounds really confusing. If you experiment with this and check the final screen, you can kind of puzzle out what you're gonna get from these skill hobbies. I'm sorry, I can't give you exact numbers or a better <laughs> description I tried. I, I don't know how to say it. Anyway, let's move on. Now our next tab is the stats tab. Stats in character creation are pretty important. There are some mods that let you improve them over time, but in vanilla it's pretty difficult to change your initial stats and you will not be doing it until you're pretty well established in the game. So if you fail to give your character good starting attributes, you're probably going to struggle in the early game. We have Strength, Dexterity, Intelligence, and Perception. If you move the selector over a particular stat, you will see a display on the right slash center of the screen that will tell you what the stat currently affects. Now this is not all inclusive, these stats do things that are not listed here. For instance, perception at certain thresholds will give you a bonus to how far you can see in the dark. If I recall correctly, this is perception 9 and perception 12, and if you pass that number you get an extra tile of vision in darkness. And because of that, it's usually a good idea to at least boost your character's perception to level 9, so you can get that extra tile. Anyway, not all stats are created equally. Due to the nature of aiming in this game, for instance, I generally neglect my dexterity. Yes, it helps with ranged accuracy, and I think it factors into your dodge ability. I'm just, I just don't care that much. Dexterity does do other things, but since I'm not big on dodge or using martial arts, it really doesn't appeal to me very much. In general, in my own personal opinion, strength is the most valuable stat. It increases your HP, which is pretty important, as well as makes you better in melee, which makes surviving the early game much easier. Sure, intelligence helps you learn things faster, which is valuable as you progress, but probably won't do much for you in your first couple of games as a brand new player. Ultimately, it's up to you which stats you want to improve and which you don't. You're probably not going to screw this up so much that it ruins your game or makes something impossible. I recommend leaning on strength more than any other stat, but that is up to you. And honestly, in your first couple of games, you're not going to fully understand what all of your stats impact. That is something that's going to come with game experience, and you're going to kind of learn which you want the most when you start your character. Now, I do recommend, though, that you spend most of your points on stats and traits in character creation since they're much harder to obtain in the game. Don't go around spending all your points on skills and then leave your character with an 8 in all stats, it will just make the game more difficult for you. 
So again, read what they do and then assign points as you see fit. And remember, if you're using single pool points, you can return to this screen later after getting points from negative traits and assign even more points to your stats. Now each stat increase will cost you one point, but to raise a stat above 12, each increment will then cost two points instead. Now 12 is considered above average, so it's fine to leave it at that and save yourself that cost penalty. But let's move on now to the Traits tab. Now, this is really what makes your character unique and different from other characters that you will play. This screen and list might seem very intimidating, and I suppose that it is complicated, but let's break it down. Now, on the left column, you will see a list of traits that positively affect your character in some way. They will cost you points, but are generally helpful. You can see how many points a trait will cost by hovering it in this menu, and it will appear at the top panel of the screen below the tabs. Now, in this middle column, we have negative traits. Now, these are things that will usually penalize your character in some way, but will add points that you can spend for character creation. And again, you can see how many points they add at the top of the screen. Screen. The right column on this screen is the cosmetic only traits list. Now these exist so that you can customize the look of your character. Depending on your tile set, these will actually be visible in the game. So if you choose a black mohawk, you will look different from a bald character in most tile sets. Now the traits on the right hand side are free and cost you no points, but only one of each type can be selected. Currently, there is eye color, facial hair, head hair, and skin tone. Now, some tile sets do not allow all of these options. For example, eye color is a relatively recent addition, and some tile sets do not have that. Whether your set allows for these options or not, they are purely cosmetic and have no impact whatsoever on your actual gameplay. Alright, so you're probably looking at this trait list and you have no idea where to begin. Well, you can start by highlighting traits that you think are interesting. At the bottom of the screen, you will see a description of what that trait does. And of course, as a new player, you really don't know what a lot of this stuff will mean for the purposes of gameplay. My recommendation is that you look at the point cost. Now, these are not perfectly balanced, but they will give you an idea of how dangerous or beneficial a trait is. Combine that with your common sense and you'll probably have some idea. For instance, the narcoleptic trait gives you three points because it's a very negative negative trait. Three points is kind of a lot for a trait, and given that you will randomly fall asleep for no reason, you can probably puzzle out that that trait would be extremely difficult for a new player to deal with. In contrast, something like the deft trait only costs one point. Now the description says that you will recover better from misses. That doesn't sound terribly useful, and the point cost is so low that you can probably extrapolate that the trait is not going to have a huge impact on your gameplay. So I would encourage you to read through any trait that you think would be interesting. Many of them have self-explanatory names and accurate descriptions, so I don't expect you to struggle too much with this. But before we move on, I suppose I should give you some traits I would encourage you to take and some that I think you should avoid. So first off, what are some positive traits that you should take? The main one that I recommend to people is the night vision trait. This will give you an extra tile of vision range when you're in the dark. Since a lot of new players will raid towns at night, this can really help keep you alive. It does cost two points, but I generally take it on every character. If you've watched other tutorials in the past from myself or from Formithrax, you may have seen us recommend the pack mule trait. Just as a heads up, pack mule was reworked and is no longer a valuable trait in my opinion, so I would skip that one. Now on the negative trait side, I would recommend that if you don't want to play with NPCs, you should take the ugly and truth teller traits. If you never plan on interacting with other characters, then these are just free points. I also think that squeamish is a pretty free trait. It keeps you from wearing filthy clothing, which is something you're going to want to avoid anyway, although it will limit your options of what to wear when you're still learning the game because you won't be able to wear filthy clothing. Now let's talk about some traits that you should probably stay away from. Narcoleptic, as I mentioned, can be really tough for a new player. Illiterate can be very challenging because books play a very important role in this game. Calyptic psychosis should also be avoided. It will require you to find medication to manage hallucinations. And then finally, you might have noticed something called genetic downward spiral. This is an extremely challenging trait, causing you to frequently mutate, and all of the mutations you receive will be negative. This is probably the most difficult trait in the character creation menu, and I wouldn't go anywhere near it unless you want to watch your character fail miserably. It's fun, don't get me wrong, but it's definitely only for experienced players. And then let's touch on these food traits here. Now these traits make it so that your character will become sick if they eat certain types of food. It's a pretty extreme reaction. The allergies basically make you sick no matter how little of that food you have eaten. I typically play lactose intolerant characters because I am somewhat lactose intolerant in real life, but I don't recommend these for new players. A lot of people seem to talk about struggling to find food and you really want to be able to eat whatever you find, so taking these food allergy traits can make that a little harder. Harder. But okay, I think that's enough talking about traits. We could probably go through them and make a whole episode on that, but we should really move on. I think I've given you enough of an idea that you should be able to puzzle out what traits you would like.
like, but do try to remember that if you take negative traits and you're using single pool, you can distribute those points elsewhere in character creation. But okay, let's talk about the skills tab. So skills recently underwent a rework probably last year, in, in the last year or so. So if you've watched older tutorials or you are a returning player, this probably looks a little different from how you remember. When you select a skill with your indicator, a description will be displayed on the right and the point cost for increasing it will be listed at the top of the screen. It's worth noting that the first time you raise a skill, it will actually increase by two levels, so you get more value out of that initial point investment than you do for subsequent bumps. You'll also be able to see any of the skills that your profession gives, they will be listed here as well. Now regardless of your profession skills, that first purchase will always give you two levels in the skill, so don't worry about that. Now skills are pretty self-explanatory, but several of them have been merged and renamed. Applied science, for instance, is primarily chemistry, but it is used for all sorts of sciencey things. Food handling is not just your ability to cook food, but also to brew alcohol, for instance. Now it is important that you look over the list and read what they do. Unfortunately, as a new player, you will not really know a lot of this stuff. You'll become more familiar with which skills are valuable and which are not as you play the game and get that game experience. Vehicles, for instance, is basically used for controlling vehicles when off-roading or driving at high speeds. It is really not a very valuable skill and will generally level up pretty fast in the game, so it's not worth putting any points into. Athletics is almost never used and I don't think I've ever needed or wanted that skill. So I would avoid spending points on raising those unless you really have a good reason to. Anyway, in general, I recommend spending your points on attributes and traits not on leveling your skills. But as a new player, it can be beneficial to try out different skills by testing different characters. For instance, if you want to learn more about what you can craft with a high fabrication skill, you could start a character with Fab 5 and just go in the game and look at what you're able to do. It's worth noting as well that if you start the game with a certain skill level, you will already have unlocked all the crafting recipes that you would normally learn at that skill level. You will also gain many recipes that you would normally find in a book for that skill level. Anything too complicated complicated or obscure won't be learned, but this is an easy way to quickly get a bunch of crafting recipes without putting in the work or finding the book that you would normally require. In general though, raising skills in the game is pretty straightforward. There are a few different ways to do it, and as you learn the game, you will learn which skills are valuable and which are not. So don't worry too much about this, for your first few games, it's going to become clearer as you go. After you've played for a little while, you'll start to think, well, I'm, I'm always trying to raise my fabrication to level 2, and then you might decide, I'm just going to start my characters from then on with Fab 2. So let's move over to the final tab, this one is labeled Description. Here you will see a summary of your character, but there are also some things that we can change. So let's break this down piece by piece. At the top you will see how many points you have remaining, if any, as well as your scenario and the profession that you've chosen. At the bottom you will see a list of things that you have already set, like your stats and your skills. And in the middle section here are some things that we can actually change. First here we have our character name. You can press N to get a random name, this will generate a random name based, I think, on your gender. In Cataclysm, you will often also have a nickname show up that will be listed in single quotes in between your, your first name and your surname. And if you press enter here, you can manually enter a name for your character. You can also move down to swap your gender. You can do this by pressing enter when you have it highlighted to select it from a small menu, or you can press the at symbol to switch gender. Now you can also use left and right arrows to change your gender if you have that word highlighted. Now as of the time of this recording, you do not have the option to play as a non-binary character. I'm sorry about that. I know the dev team a little bit. I don't think this is them making any kind of political statement or having malicious intent. Now I've asked about this in the dev discord and apparently it's just a bullion, a leftover uh, for, probably from like a decade ago when the game started. It is also tied to some NPC dialogue and changing something like that would require a decent amount of work for the purposes of adding a third or manually entered option. But don't feel discouraged. When I asked about this, people seemed receptive and like that is a possibility in the future. And we we are a pretty inclusive community, there's just some stuff left over from a long time ago. Again, I don't think it's like a political statement or anything like that. Hopefully someday, preferably in the near future, you will have that option. Next up we have your height, age, and some other information. Height and age can both be affected by pressing left or right to change the value or by pressing enter and then specifically typing in something. Now there are limits on what your height or age can be. I don't really know why there are limits, but there are. And then we have blood type as well. This is something that as of this recording has absolutely no purpose in the game whatsoever and is purely for flavor. You can only see your blood type in the character menu and as far as I know, it has zero impact on anything in the game. In the future, blood type may become important for trans 
transfusions, although I'm not sure when or if those will be added. In the next column over, we can see our starting location. Now you can change your starting location by pressing the forward slash key. This will open a small menu that lets you select either a random or specific location. The options that are available here will depend on your starting scenario. For instance, in the evacuee start that I suggested, you will always start in an evac shelter. Changing your location just lets you change the physical layout of that shelter. But if I select something else, say the large building scenario, and then I edit my starting location, you'll see that I have different options. I have the option of starting in a hospital, two different areas of the mall, or on an apartment building rooftop. These are, as of the time of this recording, the large buildings in the game that are available for you to start in. Do not forget to check your starting location. Many of the scenarios offer a large variety of locations, especially those that start you inside of a town. This is the main way to shake things up when you feel like you've started in the same place over and over. If you look at the bottom here, you will also see a list of hotkeys that are available on this screen. The most notable one here is to press asterisk, which will randomize everything on this screen except for your selected starting location. Try not to bump this button if you've already got everything set up the way you want it. And then finally, as a mild note, remember that if you randomize into a female character, you may want to go back to the trait screen if you've assigned yourself any facial hair. If you want a bearded lady, that's cool, no judgment, but I have definitely accidentally given facial hair to my female character. And I think with that internet, we're about to wrap our character creation episode. This was a very long episode. I tried really hard to make things brief where possible. Hopefully I still conveyed all the information that you need. Feel free to ask any questions you have in the description down below. And remember that this stuff changes all the time. But anyway, hopefully you enjoyed the video. Thanks so much for watching. I of course will be back with more in the near future and I'll see you in the next video.